back in, I want to say it was 2017, I was on a missions trip to the great country of Peru, Lima, Peru, and Huaraz, Peru, up in the mountains. It was a great missions trip. We were working with uh, kids kind of putting on a vacation Bible school, teaching them uh, the scriptures and doing songs and kind of a skit that talked about and outlined the gospel. Really a great mission trip. I, I think back on those days fondly. I actually went there twice, uh, two years in a row during spring break with my school, Cedarville University. We did mission trips with them, uh, the same missions organization we went with both times. But I remember when we were there the first year, in 2017, we were at this water park, and it was not like a water park that you would think of like Roaring Springs, where you are in like wave pools and water slides. It was literally a water park, like there was just fountains and lights and music. It was water in a park. So there was no rides, but there was a lot of people there. It kind of felt like a fairground. And there was this, it was late at night, it was kind of like the grand finale, and there was this big waterworks show. Like I said, with this, these in-sync lights mixed with music that was in Spanish that we didn't understand, but it sounded really cool. And all of this, these water features lit up uh, in the dark. It was truly, it was fun. It was something I hadn't really been to in that manner before. I mean, I'd, I've never driven to a water park that was just water shooting out of the ground and me watching it uh, for that purpose. But I thought it was cool. We were in Peru, part of our uh, mission ship. So I was standing there. There was kind of like this white fence around the big fountain area. And I was standing there and the show starts and there was this family, this mom and this little boy that kind of pushed their way through the crowd and they were standing right on my left-hand side. So there was this little boy right here on my left-hand side, right next to me. And as the show starts and the lights start going off and the music starts playing, this little boy is having the time of his life. I mean, he was so cute. And I remember he gets to the fence and he's standing on the fence, like barely can look over. And he kept saying in Spanish, mira mama, mira mama, like over and over again. Everything that he saw, every color, every uh, time that the water would shift and change, he was just just captured and captivated by what he was seeing. And I remember just looking at that and just enjoying it, enjoying someone else be captivated by something that was beautiful. It was uh, colorful and it was fun and there was choreography and music. And like I said, all of these things coming together surrounded by friends and family. It really was a beautiful moment. And this kid was having the time of his life. He was captivated. Now, I want to imagine that some of you being at a water park that was just uh, water shooting up and colors being strewn across the water and music playing in Spanish that you didn't quite understand, uh, there might be a possibility that rather than being like this little boy next to me who was captivated by the show, you'd probably be on your phone texting with your friends on social media. None of you here, maybe, but someone your age, right, being on your phone, really not caring about what it was that was in front of you. And, and if we're honest, I'm sure there's been at some point Somewhere that you've been where your parents are like, hey, pay attention. Hey, I want you to see this. I want you to look. Hey, I want you to enjoy the moment. And you're kind of like, uh, I'd rather, whatever's going on on my phone, I'd rather look at that rather than this moment. So you've got these two distinct responses. You've got this little boy that this is like the first time he's ever seen anything like this. And he's amazed by it and captivated by it. And then there's another response, perhaps, that's like, uh, I don't really care. I've seen this before or it's not interesting enough or it's not catching me or captivating me quite in the same way, perhaps, as a young kid who hasn't experienced something like that before. Well, I bring that up because it's interesting and unique in the Gospels throughout the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What they do is they give us snapshots of Jesus again and again and again. And what we see actually is people responding to these snapshots in various ways. We've covered those uh, over however many sermons that we've been in, Mark. I think this is number 15. And we've covered all of those responses where people have looked at Jesus like this little kid almost for the first time, and they're captivated, and they're amazed, and, and they respond with, with worship, and they respond by wanting to follow him and dedicate their life to him. And then there's these other individuals that look at him, and they accuse him, and 
they doubt him or perhaps they're upset by him, whether it's the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or whether it's just the crowd that perhaps is entertained by Jesus, but they're not captivated by Jesus. We reach a story this evening as we wrap up Mark chapter 5 that I truly think is captivating. And I think the gospel writer of Mark wants us to look at this story of Jesus and to be captivated, to be like this little boy looking at this light show with water and all those things for the first time and being amazed. Mom, look, look at what is in front of us. This is amazing. I think the gospel of Mark, Mark writes this story so that we look at it and say to ourselves, this is truly amazing. We, we see Jesus for who he really is, and it's amazing. It's incredible. And that's my desire for us this evening, that we would look at this story with fresh eyes and that we wouldn't respond as like, a, uh, I've seen better things, or uh, it's not quite what I was expecting, or I would rather be doing something else. I want us to be amazed and captivated by this incredible story of Jesus really healing two distinct people, a little girl, as we'll see, Jairus' daughter, and then the woman that has an issue of blood. So if you've got your Bibles with you, open up to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, we're going to be in looking at verses 21 through 43. Now, a longer section of Scripture, but this is one big unit, one big story, again, that I think Mark places here so that we see Jesus, that we really see him. Jesus often says in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen these words, seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear. I want you to see Jesus in this text and to see him clearly, and that it wouldn't be said of you, that seeing Jesus, you don't see him. You don't see him for who he truly is, and you're not captivated by him. I, I want us all to be amazed and captivated by this story, and ultimately by Jesus himself. So Mark chapter 5, let's begin reading in verse 21. It says, and when Jesus has, had crossed again in the boat to the other side. Now let's just back up a little bit. The last time we were in Mark, we talked about demons, which was uh, a lot of fun. But Jesus goes across the Sea of Galilee, you remember. He gets out of the boat. He's met with a demoniac who is possessed by multiple demons, many de demons. They say, we are legion for we are many. So he has this encounter with this demoniac, this individual that's possessed by demons. If you remember, he was living in the graves. He was living among the dead. He was harming himself. He was wailing and screaming day and night. Jesus uh, exercises. He banishes those demons, places them in a herd of swine. They run off the cliff, jump in the water. And basically the herdsmen are like, hey, Jesus, get out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. And that's where our story picks up in verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat back to the other side, so now he's on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. It says, a great crowd gathered about him, which is just an interesting juxtaposition or comparison, you might say, because when Jesus leaves the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they're asking him to leave. They're, they're asking him to, to be gone. They, they don't want him there any longer. And yet when he reaches the west side of the sea, it says a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. And the implication is that he's teaching them as Jesus was known to do. Verse 22, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he went, that's Jesus, he went with Jairus, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So that's kind of the first snapshot of the story that we see. This guy named Jairus, we're told he is a ruler of the synagogue. He was involved in keeping order in the synagogue, perhaps planning the worship services and executing them somewhat in a similar fashion to a pastor, a little bit different, but that type of role. He was a ruler of the synagogue. His name was Jairus. He has this daughter. She's at the point of death. She's not doing well. If you can imagine, this is a father who is hurting for his little girl. This little girl that is 12 years old, that she's about to lose her life. We don't know why. It doesn't tell us why. But we know that this is a desperate father, desperately seeking after Jesus, because he's heard things about this man, Jesus. That's how the story starts. 
Now in verse 25, we're introduced to another woman. Well, Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house to help with his little girl. Look at verse 25. It says, And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. And we don't know what this blood issue was. Some people think it was some sort of internal hemorrhage. Uh, but regardless, she was literally bleeding, whether it was on or off or every day. Again, some of those specifics we aren't told. But she was bleeding pretty much constantly for 12 years straight. I mean, imagine just how terrible that would be. So there's this woman who's in this intense situation. It has a discharge of blood. She's got this internal hemorrhage of some, short, of some sort, bleeding almost every day, day in, day out, week in, week out for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians. She's going to the doctors. Hey, can you fix me? And they're not helping. It says it had spent all that she had. All of her money and her resources are gone and was no better, but rather grew worse. This woman is in terrible uh, condition. Verse 27, she, this woman, had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. She knew and, and heard something about Jesus, of his power, of his miracles, of his teaching. She was so desperate and perhaps so confident in this man, Jesus, that he had so much power. She's saying to herself, even if I touch his garments, if I just get close enough to him, the power of Jesus, I will be made well, is what she says in verse 28. And then in verse 29, it says, and immediately after she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you, you see the crowd pressing around you, right? If you remember, a great crowd, it says at the beginning, was thronging about them. It's tight quarters. They're all following Jesus. They're enamored by Jesus. So the disciples are like, Jesus, what are you talking about? There's people everywhere. You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So just a dramatic interruption. Again, Jesus, he's approached by Jairus, this religious leader. His daughter is on her deathbed. He's begging and pleading with Jesus, come to my house, help me heal my daughter. Jesus on the way meets this woman, is interrupted and heals her and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. You are no longer sick. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now we pick it back up in verse 35 with the rest of the story about Jairus and his daughter. While he was still speaking, Jesus, there came from the ruler's house, Jairus' house, someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So while Jesus is interrupted with this story of this woman who has been bleeding for 12 years and she is healed because she touches his garment, it says the little girl who Jesus was on his way to heal uh, has died. She's lost her life. Verse 36. But overhearing, Jesus overheard what they said. Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the inner three disciples that Jesus would often have with him in these specific moments. He allowed no one except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. Now, what's interesting about this is actually during this time, it was customary to hire people to weep and wail for you, which was kind of a strange thing, but that's what they did. So these are people, they're like kind of like hired actors in a sense that would make all of this noise. It was kind of to signify to others that something has happened and there's mourning in the house. So that's these people that we are introduced to. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, these hired people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in, and went in, went in where the child was. 
Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. Now that phrase, Talitha kumi, is Aramaic. That was the language that Jesus spoke. The Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek primarily, but the common language of that day Jesus spoke primarily uh, was Aramaic. So that's the Aramaic phrase, uh, which is translated by Mark, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. What a, what a tender moment for Jesus. He heals this girl and is like, hey, get her a snack. She literally just died. Like she needs to eat something. You guys are crazy. Uh, he strictly charged them and that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Now, there's a lot of things going on in this story. There's a lot of verses uh, that we just read. But again, the, the whole point that I'm wanting to communicate this evening is that I want us to see who Jesus is. In fact, that's the, the, the point there on your outline. Number one, see Jesus for who he is. This isn't just a story to tell us some of the things that Jesus did. It's a story that's intended to help us see Jesus for who he was and who he is. It's an incredible story. Lots of moving parts, lots of connections and things that we need to unpack. But I want you to see Jesus looking at this story for who he is. And ultimately, I want you to respond like the people responded when he heals this little girl in verse 42. They were immediately overcome with amazement. They were saying, look at what just happened. Like that little boy saying, mira mama, mira mama. Look mom, I want you to see this. These people were immediately overcome with amazement. By what he had done, sure, but by Jesus himself. See Jesus for who he is. There's a lot of things that we could pick out from this passage about who Jesus is, but there are three primary things, the subpoints there, that I think are going to be helpful for us. And the first thing that we see and learn about Jesus is that he is available. That's letter A. He is available. There's a lot of things going on, like I've said in this story. We've got Jairus, we've got the disciples, we've got the little girl, we've got the woman, all of these different characters all kind of coming together. And yet what we see of Jesus so clearly is that he is available to those who are around him. Now, why is that important? Well, first and foremost, why was Jesus on earth from his own words? He says, I came to serve and not to be served. I came, Jesus says, to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came so that others might have life and life abundantly, as Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John. So as a part of that, if you can think back, we talked about Jesus' kingdom priorities. This was months ago now, but we had those three priorities. Jesus, his priorities was prayer, preaching, and people. He was there to minister and to love people, to call them into a relationship with himself, to make himself available to them, to be an encouragement, again, to, to help them have a relationship with the eternal God. He makes himself available. We see this in several ways in this story, but the first one is that first section about Jairus and his daughter. There's this frantic father that comes to Jesus, and what is Jesus doing? He's by the water, and he's teaching a great crowd of people. Now, I want you to imagine, similarly, that I'm up here teaching, and someone runs up the stairs, and they say, hey, Josiah, I need you, right? And I just got up and left. I mean, it wouldn't be a big deal if the moment was appropriate, but that's kind of the scene that's happening. Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee. There are people listening to him teach. He's explaining the kingdom of God. He's explaining the gospel, the message of the kingdom. And yet he's interrupted by this guy, Jairus, who's telling him that he needs him. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm available. So he begins to follow Jesus. That's verse 24. And he went with him. He went with Jairus. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Even in the story with the, the woman that had the issue of blood, what do we see? Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house. Jesus has a specific mission and a focus. He's been, it's been communicated to him that there is a great need for him to fulfill. And yet in verse 30, it talks about Jesus perceiving in himself that there had been power that had gone out from him. There are, he stops, right? And there's this, this, there's this moment where he turns about in the crowd and he says, who touched, it, who touched my garment? 
So he's on his way to Jairus' house, and yet he is stopped by this woman. So there's these two situations. He's by the sea, and he's teaching, and he's interrupted by Jairus, and he says, you know what? I'm going to come with you. I'm going to come. I'm going to minister to you. I'm going to heal your daughter. But on his way to doing that, to healing Jairus' daughter, he gets interrupted again by another person who needs him, and he stops again to meet their needs. Again and again and again. In this story, we see Jesus makes himself available to those who are seeking him in genuine faith. He makes himself available, again, to help them, to love them, to encourage them, and ultimately to call them into a relationship with himself as the the King of kings and Lord of lords. And part of what's incredible about this, even coming off of the heels of the story of the demoniac, Jesus does this incredible thing. He heals this man. Remember, we use that illustration of Ethan being filled with a bunch of demons, and if he got rescued, how we would respond and say, Ethan, we're so glad that you're no longer a nut job with a thousand, an- or not angels, a thousand demons in you. But what we see in this story is that this guy, who undoubtedly was known by these people around him, he gets healed of the, this demonic possession, and their response was, was not this is great. We're so glad you helped our friend. Their response was, leave. We want nothing to do with you. We don't want you here. So even coming off of the heels of this story where Jesus is rejected, where he is basically forced to leave, what we see immediately is that Jesus making himself available, available to these people who are in need. So the Savior, right, the, the person that we're looking at, Jesus, that we're trying to see clearly, he makes himself available even when he is rejected. Because even in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen the Pharisees reject him. We, we've seen the crowds reject him. Even in Mark chapter 4, when there's the great storm, we saw the disciples reject him when they accused him of not caring for them. Basically, everyone is rejecting Jesus except for a select few, and yet Jesus continues to make himself available. Even when he is rejected, even when he's misunderstood. If you remember, he's accused of breaking the law. He's accused of breaking the Sabbath. He's accused of all of these things, of, of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, all of these things. He's, he's healing, and they attribute his healing power uh, to Beelzebul, the prince of demons. He's accused. He's misunderstood. He's rejected. And yet again and again, even though he came into his own and his own received him not, he continues to make himself available available to those that seek him in faith. This is incredible. Think about this in your life. Think about the people in your life that have rejected you, that have uh, perhaps misunderstood you. Perhaps they have accused you. What has been your response to those people? I know my temptation is not to make myself available to them. It's to actively perhaps ignore them or avoid them or to be awkward around them, right? Because there's this tension in the air. And yet Jesus, despite all of that, despite people and humanity in general accusing him, rejecting him, and misunderstanding him, he makes himself available again and again for those who seek him in faith. It's an incredible part of this story. That's the first thing that we see, that Jesus makes himself available. The second thing that we see about Jesus is that he truly is powerful. That's letter B. He is powerful. Now, I titled this sermon, Jesus, Lord of Life. And perhaps that might be obvious for you, but the reason why is because Jesus literally heals this little girl who has died. He's raised her from the dead. He has power over life itself. And Jesus demonstrates in an incredible way that he truly is the Lord and master of life itself. And even think about that. Jesus, the Lord of life, making himself available for us. That's kind of the idea of even that psalm that talks about who is man that you are mindful of us. Who am I that the king of the universe, that the one who sustains the universe by the word of his power, who am I that he would make himself available and would utilize his power for my good? That's what we see in this story, the power of Jesus on full display. And the first way that we see that is in this story with this woman who is healed of this disease. Look again in verse 27 with me. Mark says she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made 
well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. After 12 long years of trying to fix the problem, of going to see the doctors, of spending all of her money and her time and her energy after all of this time of not getting better, but rather growing worse, Jesus does in an instant what no other doctor could do over 12 years. One moment with Jesus undoes, undoes all of that 12 years of pain. She is healed. And immediately it says the flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, we covered this in the main service, which I know not everyone perhaps was there, so I won't go into great detail, but there's a lot of things going on that connect to the Old Testament law when it comes to this story. What's the big deal about this woman who has an issue with blood? Well, specifically, the Levitical law during, the, during this time was, had specific provisions for a couple of different things, things that made you basically ceremonially un clean. So a a woman that had this discharge of blood was ceremonially unclean for the days that she had that impurity. This comes from Leviticus 15 verses 25 through 27. It says, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness, as in the days of her impurity she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And there's a lot of stuff going on in that passage, but here's what's important for us to understand. There's this woman that approaches Jesus and by Levitical law standards, she is ceremonially unclean. Again, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds of all of this. What you really need to understand is that the purity laws, the the ceremony laws, were intended to highlight the holiness of God in comparison to the impurity of the people of Israel. Because what we find again and again in Scripture is that the purity of God's holiness and the impurity of man's sinfulness are completely at odds. And so the ceremonial laws in that sense, being clean versus unclean, were meant to highlight that we are sinful people who were unclean in the eyes of the Lord. And that was not just women, that was men as well. So there was all of these laws that were meant to highlight that, that we are sinners that are unclean, that are in desperate need to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's the woman that we find in this story. She has had this condition, this condition of bleeding for 12 years that has made her ceremonially unclean. So that means everything that she touches, everyone that she touches, that they become unclean. And as a Jew, that was something that you actively avoided. That was something that you didn't want. So if you can imagine, this woman, she loses perhaps her home. She loses her friends and her family, her community. She loses all of these things, and she is desperate. She spent all of her money. Uh, She's been isolated from community. She's separated from all of that, and she's in this place of desperation. And what does Jesus do? Immediately, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. I want to make the connection quickly between this woman and Jairus. Why is there this story about Jairus with this woman kind of sandwiched in the middle? Well, the thing that I would say, as one author puts it, is that the woman exemplifies and defines faith for Jairus. She shows him what it means to have faith, to see Jesus for who he truly is, and to pursue him in faith. So the author says the woman exemplifies and defines faith for Jairus, which means to trust Jesus despite everything to the contrary. That faith knows no limits, not even raising of a dead child. So we've got this story inserted between this greater story of Jairus and his dying daughter. And this story is meant to be something that encourages Jairus to see 
Jesus for who he is, the person who has the power and the authority and the availability to help him even in the midst of impossible circumstances. And again, we see that in verses 41 and 42. Look at it with me. Mark says, taking her, this little girl, by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, there's that word again, the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Now let's make some other connections here really, quick, really quickly between the woman who was ceremonially unclean and this little girl. So the text tells us that this 12-year-old girl, she dies. So not only is there Levitical law provisions that say if you're bleeding, specifically as a woman, that you are unclean, there's also a law that basically says if you touch a dead body, you are also unclean. That's Numbers 19 verse 11. It says, whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. So there's these two stories with these two individuals that represent some form of being unclean that Jesus interacts with. And yet in somewhat of a surprising way, rather than Jesus being made unclean because of interacting and touching and engaging with them, the opposite happens. They walk away having been cleansed by Jesus. They both come to Jesus, proverbially, because the little girl is dead, but they both come to Jesus, and yet they come to Jesus unclean, and yet they walk away clean because they see Jesus, specifically the woman in Jairus, for who he is. There's these two Levitical laws. Again, Jesus is like, whoa, okay. the, the, the disciples perhaps and the Jews around him are like, okay, you're going to touch the dead body and you've been touched by this woman. How is all of this working? Well, rather than Jesus becoming unclean, he's making people in his power clean through his power and authority over all things. And even the, the, the context, the greater context of where this story falls, if you think back even to uh, the end of Mark chapter 4, where they are crossing the Sea of Galilee in their boats, and that's the, the story of Jesus calming the storms, and uh, the storm and the disciples are kind of freaking out, and then they're saying, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that the water is coming into the boat, that the waves are tossing us to and fro? There it says, and he awoke Jesus and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. So it starts in this greater context where Jesus has control completely over the physical world. And then it moves on to the first part of chapter 5 where he crosses the Sea of Galilee, gets out, interacts with this man that has a legion of demons inside of him. And yet what does he do? He exerts his power and his control over them. So we've got Jesus showing his power over the physical world, calming the wind and the waves. Then we've got Jesus showing his power over the spiritual world, commanding the demons to leave this man. He, he heals him of that. And then we come to our story and we see Jesus again having power over life itself. Again and again and again, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is demonstrating he has all power and all authority. Jesus is powerful. He calms the storm. He heals the demoniac. He raises the little girl from the dead, and he cleanses or he heals the woman that has this disease for 12 years. Jesus is powerful. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. So the two things that we've seen so far, Jesus, we see him for who he is. He is an available Savior. He is a powerful Savior. And the third thing that we see, let us see, is that he is tender. He is a tender Savior. He cares for the individuals that he is interacting with. He cares for them. He loves them. He pursues them. He shows his tenderness. The first way that we see that is Mark 5, verse 34. Look at that with me. This is after... Jesus heals this woman after they kind of have this exchange. She falls down and came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And here's what Jesus says. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, one of my favorite parts about this section of the story is that when this begins in verse 25, 
it says, and there was a woman. She's got no name. We don't know anything about her. She's got no title, no respect, no positions of authority, nothing. She's just some random, unidentified woman. And yet when Jesus encounters with her, he tenderly calls her daughter, making a claim that she now is in a relationship with him. He cares for her and loves her as a daughter. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. She goes from being a no-named nobody to being a daughter of the king, someone who was claimed by Jesus in his tenderness. He says, daughter, your faith in me has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. We also see his tenderness even when he's talking to the little girl in verse 41. He says, taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means the little girl, I say to you, Arise. Now, the way that this is written in the original language, there's a, there's a subtle sort of tenderness. It's, it's almost fatherly. Jesus comes in. He's just expressing concern. He's slowing down, even taking her by the hand. It's sweet and soft and, and subtle. He's showing his tenderness and his love for those who are in need. Even later on in the Gospel of Mark, it talks about how Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Again and again, we see the tenderness of Jesus to slow down, to make himself available, to utilize, to wield his power, to help other people, to rescue them, to redeem them, to heal them, to raise them from the dead. Incredible to help them to see that he truly is the Messiah, that he is the King. Now, to conclude all of this, I want us to compare and contrast Jairus and the woman, because I think this is really important for us. When we're first introduced to Jairus, we are told that he is a ruler of the synagogue. So I just said, when we were introduced to the woman in verse 25, she's got no name, she's got no title, and no identity. So immediately, we've got this ruler, this man of authority, this man of esteem, versus this woman who is a nobody, that doesn't have a name, that doesn't have a position. We've got this Jewish leader who's representative of people who are quote-unquote on the inside, and then we've got this woman who is unclean, who represents people who are on the outside. Now, what's the point of all of that? Well, this story teaches us that regardless of Jairus and his position, or this woman, or her lack of position, they are both the same at the feet of Jesus. That's what this story teaches us, because they both end up in the exact same place. In fact, Jairus, in verse 22, it says, he came to Jesus and he fell at his feet. In verse 33, the woman, when she came to Jesus, she fell down before him and told him the whole truth. The the beauty of our Savior is that no matter your background, title and esteem or someone who is obscure and a nobody. We all come to Jesus and we are all the same before the feet of Jesus. There's a beautiful truth that this story displays. Now let's talk even about the woman for a second and the little girl. The woman we saw was sick for 12 years. The little girl died. How old was the little girl? She was 12. Now do you think the author of this story was random in her being 12 and the woman being sick for 12 years? The answer is no. (laughs) There's no random details in these narratives, in these stories. The woman was sick for 12 years. The little girl died after living for 12 years. So what's the connection? Well, figuratively speaking, because this woman was ceremonially unclean, because she was separated and isolated, this woman was basically living as a dead person, right? For years, all of her relationships, all of her contact, all of these things, it was as if she was dead for 12 years. She couldn't go to the temple and worship. She couldn't offer sacrifices. She couldn't touch her friends or family or that they would be unclean. This woman basically was living as a dead person for 12 years. 
And in reverse, the little girl who had had 12 years of life, she loses her life after 12 years. We've got this great reversal where this woman, the living dead, suddenly is alive. And we've got this little girl who was living for 12 years and suddenly is dead. Now, what's the point in all of that? Well, this story teaches us that no matter the background, no matter the problem, no matter the the thing that seems seemingly impossible for Jesus to overcome, no matter what the circumstances are, Jesus provides new life. Whether it's this woman that's been living as a dead person figuratively, figuratively for 12 years, or this little girl that had 12 years of life and then lost it, Jesus provides new life through his power and authority. This is an incredible story about an incredible Savior that came to seek and to save the lost. He made himself available. He demonstrated his power and used it to help people physically, but even more than that, spiritually, to invite them into a relationship, to give them the gift of eternal life. And he expresses his tenderness again and again. Someone who demonstrates his compassion for us who are lost like sheep without a shepherd. We need to see Jesus, that no matter, again, whether we have titles and respect and authority or whether we come from a background of obscurity, we are all the same at the feet of Jesus. No matter the background, no matter the problem, Jesus provides new life because Jesus himself is the Lord of life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. For the picture of Jesus that we see so clearly in this story. Father, I pray for the students here that we would respond truly with amazement, that we would be captivated by our Savior, that we would see him for who he is, that we would dedicate our lives to follow him, that we would love him, that we would treasure him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So Father, I pray that as we go into the discussions now, that they would be fruitful and encouraging and glorifying to you in Jesus' name. Amen.